How's that sound? Too boomy? A bit boomy, isn't it? Where are they? A bit boomy, Tommy. <laughs> Testing, testing, testing. Is that better? Okay, can you hear clearly at the back? Great. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon, turning out in this really icy cold weather, isn't it? Um, so we're going to continue, as you know now, with the second lecture in the series on the Richaud Ancocoron. Uh, before I start, I've got one correction to make, which my attention was drawn to last time, when I was talking about various historical uh, matters. I mentioned that in the 13th century, uh, Genghis Khan was uh, overrunning the whole of Asia. Should have been Kublai Khan, sorry. Not Genghis Khan, Kublai Khan. So, uh, before I begin, to get down to today's lecture, I think since this is only the second lecture in this series on this particular Go Show, it would be wise if I gave a fairly uh, thorough summary of what happened last time, as it were. Uh, I shan't do this every time, but this time I think just to make sure that the Go Show is really ingrained in us, it'd be wise for me to do that. So. Uh, I'd like to begin by bringing out just the main points which we covered in the last lecture. Uh, I'd also like to mention that this lecture is entirely based on a lecture given by President Ikeda. Uh, it's not been translated into English, uh, but the framework and quite a lot of the points in this lecture uh, are included in his. And I really thank him for it, because otherwise it would take me weeks and weeks to prepare, whereas instead of that it takes me a week to prepare. Uh, so, first of all, the summary. So, as you will remember, the Richo Ancocoron is, although written for 13th century Japan, medieval Japan, is absolutely relevant to the state of the world today. In other words, medieval Japan's state is now the whole world state. And I say this, of course, in terms of wars, violence, inflation, pollution, exhaustion of materials, disease, starvation, and so on. So it's an amazing uh, comparison, this comparison between the small country of Japan 700 years ago or so, and the whole of the world today. So therefore, every word in this Gosha is relevant in every sense to our world as we live in it now. So, at the same time as there was social chaos in medieval Japan and in the world today, uh, there were always also tremendous natural disasters. And you all know the stories of the epidemics and earthquakes typhoons, droughts, unseasonable storms, and all the rest of it that afflicted those times. And the worst of those, they came to a peak, as it were, uh, at shortly before the time Nichiren Daishonin wrote this Gosho. So Nichiren Daishonin was born into this age of disaster and utter social chaos and disorder. And he was deeply concerned about this and because of his study of Buddhism was convinced that the social disasters were actually the cause of the natural disasters. And the social disasters themselves were because the people were basing their lives and their thinking on a completely wrong concept of life, on wrong teachings. And these false beliefs and teachings, in other words, were the root cause of all, all the unhappiness, both the social disorder and the incredible and terrible natural disasters. So he reached this conclusion at quite a young age uh, and then spent about 14 years studying all the Buddhist teachings that he could lay his hands on in Japan because he wanted to justify his beliefs 
with actual documentary proof in the flow of Buddhism. And having spent 14 years of studying, he then, in 1253, declared nam myoho kyo as an invocation. And finally, in 1260, on the 16th of July, he presented this treatise called the Risho Ankokoron to the most powerful person of the day who was a retired regent who had the whole power of, of the authority in his hand behind the scenes. His name was Hojo. You remember we also said that the official title, or rather the, the, the gener generally known title of this Gosho in English is on securing the peace of the land through the propagation of true Buddhism. Securing the peace of the land through the propagation of true Buddhism. But in fact, a more accurate translation would really be, and a much more meaningful one, would be on securing peace in the land through establishing the ultimate truth. On securing peace in the land through establishing the ultimate truth. Risho, Risho of Risho Ankokuron means establishing the truth or establishing the true law. After Nichiren Daishonin had presented this treatise to Hojo, uh, really all hell let loose on him. And he then had to undergo a series of persecutions, which most of you know about, uh, over most of the rest of the years of his life. The first one began just a month after he presented this treatise, uh, when his cottage on the outskirts of Kamakura was attacked by fanatical Nembutsu believers, believers of the Nembutsu sect. Now, Nikko Shonen had said that Nichiren Daishonin's teachings began with the Risho Ankokuron and ended with the Risho Ankokuron. The beginning and the end of everything he ever taught. The reason for this is that in the Risho Ankokuron he puts all the theory of all his teachings into action in society. He relates everything that he's taught theoretically to the actuality of society at the time in Japan. So, of course, since this also applies, the conditions of the world are so much the same, our task in teaching others Buddhism is to do the same thing, to put all the theory that Nichiren Daishonin taught into action relating it to social conditions as they are throughout the world at the moment. This is the task, isn't it, of the bodhisattvas of the earth. And in this way, it will be transmitted far into the distant future. So all over the world, the Risho Ankokuron, amongst many other Goshos, is being taught. And in that way, the heritage will be passed on. So uh, this treatise is in the form, as you'll remember, of a conversation between uh, a wise man who is acting host to another man who's on his travels. And he puts him up for the night, and uh, as they're talking during the evening, they start to discuss the state of the world in which they live. The wise man, of course, is Nichiren Daishonin, and the traveler uh, is uh, a Nembutsu follower, a follower of the Nembutsu sect. So, in that sense, it is a discussion between Nichiren Daishonin and one of the people who he feels is being so misled by the wrong philosophy and teachings. Now, this treatise, as I said, caused many persecutions, and it was a tremendous shock, because it, in Nichiren Daishonin, in saying that in the very title, establishing the ultimate truth, meant that he didn't feel anything else that was going in Japan then was the ultimate truth. So it was an arrow straight away aimed 
at the very heart of Japan, at the heart of its ruling authorities, and at the heart of all the various sects who at that time were being sponsored and supported by those ruling authorities. In a moment, I'll ask John to read the first question that the traveler asks once more, although we've already studied it, so that it will give you the feeling of it again. But it sets out, as you remember, to show the sufferings of the people in Japan at that time. And it's a graphic description which could easily describe certain parts of the world at this very moment. And it shows how the people are bewildered and confused by the events that are occurring, and how in many cases their leaders are groping about wildly and blindly to try and find a solution. So John, perhaps you could read the first question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there was once a traveler who, staying as a guest at the house of another, spoke these words in sorrow. Beginning in recent years and continuing even today, we find unusual happenings in the heavens, strange occurrences on earth, famine and pestilence, all filling every corner of the empire and spreading throughout the land. Oxen and horses lie dead in the streets. The bones of the dead crowd the highways. Over half the population has already been carried off by death, and there is not a person who does not grieve for some member of his family. During this time, there have been some who, putting all their faith in the sharp sword of the Buddha Amida, intoned the name of the Lord of the Western Paradise. Others, believing that the Buddha Yakushi will heal all ills, recite the sutra that describes him as the Tathagata of the Eastern region. Some, putting their trust in the passage in the Lotus Sutra that says, illness shall vanish at once, no old age, no death, pay homage to the wonderful words of that sutra. Others, citing the passage in the Nino Sutra that reads, the seven difficulties vanish, the seven blessings at once appear, conduct ceremonies at which a hundred preachers expound the sutra at a hundred places. There are those who, following the secret teachings of the Shingon sect, carry out prayers by filling five jars with water, and others who devote themselves entirely to Zen-type meditation, seeing the emptiness of all phenomena as clearly as the moon. Some write out the titles of the seven guardian spirits and paste them on a thousand gates, Others paint pictures of the five mighty bodhisattvas and hang them over 10,000 doorways. And still others pray to the gods of heaven and the deities of earth in ceremonies conducted at the four corners of the capital and on the four boundaries of the nation. The ruler of the nation and the governors of provinces, taking pity on the plight of the common people, make certain that government is carried out in a benevolent manner. But despite all these efforts, they merely exhaust their bodies and minds. Famine and disease rage more fiercely than ever. Beggars are everywhere in sight, and the dead fill our eyes. Corpses pile up in mounds like observation platforms. Dead bodies lie side by side like planks in a bridge. If we look about, we find that the sun and moon continue to move in their accustomed orbits and the five planets follow their proper courses. The three treasures of Buddhism continue to exist, and the period of a hundred reigns, during which the Bodhisattva Hachiman vowed to protect the nation, has not yet run out. Then why is it that the world has already fallen into decline, and that the laws of the state have come to an end? What mistake is causing this? What error has brought this about? Thank you very much. So this is a truly graphic description, isn't it, of people uh, in a state of utter confusion. Uh, I think we're fairly fortunate so far in the United Kingdom today. Society is not in too bad a state. Of course, we complain and moan about it at times, but generally speaking, it's stable. But one hasn't got to travel very far in an aeroplane to discover countries 
which are in a state of utter confusion, where similar situations exist. People gripping onto superstitious beliefs, grab, grab, grabbing anything that can give them the smallest little piece of comfort for a moment or two. And their leaders, unable to cope with the situation, trying hard to find ways in which they can keep their country surviving. So I think really if you look at the world and really analyzed it, it's in a far worse state even than medieval Japan. And of course hanging over everything is the threat of nuclear weapons. So this isn't surprising in the teachings of Buddhism because we all know we live in the age of Mapo, and 3,000 years ago Shakyamuni clearly predicted that this would be the state of the world at this time. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to those of us who know a little about Buddhism. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean to say that something hasn't got to be done about it. And of course the whole purpose of the teachings of Buddhism from the very time Shakyamuni first opened his mouth all that time ago was ultimately to cope with this incredible, confusing, baffling turmoil of an age called Mapo. So now we'll move on to uh, the first answer. John's just read the first question. Now let's look at the first answer and that really will be the subject for the lecture this afternoon. The host then spoke. I have been brooding alone upon this matter, indignant yet unable to speak. But now that you have come, we can lament together. Let us discuss the question at length. When a man leaves family life and enters the Buddhist way, it is because he hopes, through the teachings of the Dharma, to attain Buddhahood. But these days, attempts to move the gods fail to have any effect, and appeals to the power of the Buddhas produce no results. When I look carefully at the state of the world today, I see stupid people who give way to doubts because of their naivety. Therefore, they look up at the heavens and mouth their resentment, or gaze down at the earth and sink deep into anxiety. I have pondered the matter carefully with what limited resources I possess and have searched rather widely in the scriptures for an answer. The people of today all turn their backs upon what is right. To a man they all give their allegiance to evil. That is the reason why the benevolent deities have abandoned the nation and have and gone away. Why sages leave their places and do not return. And in their stead come devils and demons, disasters and calamities that arise one after another. I cannot help but speak of the matter. I cannot help being filled with fear. Thank you. So this is quite a short answer, isn't it? Yet it's one of the most important parts of this whole go show. And it explains in it in very simple terms, simple words, almost too simple, it may seem, the cause of all this suffering and unhappiness. And furthermore, the cause of the three calamities and the seven disasters which were occurring at that time in Japan. And which are occurring, of course, this, at this very time in the world about us. And the most important sentence in that uh, answer is towards the bottom of your page and I'll ask John to read it again the people of today all turn their backs upon what is right to a man they all give their allegiance to evil that is the reason why the benevolent deities have abandoned the nation and gone away why sages leave their places and do not return and in their stead come devils and demons, disasters and calamities that arise one after another. Thank you. So, all 
really the whole of the answer is in that sentence. Nichiren Daishonin is developing uh, an argument. The first point being, what is the purpose of life? What is the sort of life that we should be leading? And secondly, if life is for happiness, then what is happiness? What is true happiness? And the third point is that it is inferior teachings which are the enemy of happiness in the world. Therefore, we must seek the highest of all teachings and go on seeking until we find it. So, I think a lot of people who are in this hall today have had such a seeking mind for some reason or other, you were dissatisfied with the state of affairs of your own life or of this world, and you set out to seek something. Maybe you didn't do it consciously, maybe it was quite subconscious, but because of that motivation in your life, you found the Gohonzon. I want to explain Nichiren Daishonin's views, which are so very briefly set out in that one short answer, by means of, first of all, relating it to the Ten Worlds, relating our life and our happiness to the theory of the Ten Worlds, and secondly, to the concept of benefit in Buddhism, and thirdly, to the question of the protection of what we call the Buddhist gods, the Shoten Zenjin, or, as we call them in colloquial language, the forces of the universe. So before I uh, go on, I'd like John just to read that sentence, that important sentence, once more. The people of today all turn their backs upon what is right. To a man, they all give their allegiance to evil. That is the reason why the benevolent deities have abandoned the nation and gone away why sages leave their places and do not return, and in their stead come devils and demons, disasters and calamities that arise one after another. Thank you. Turn their backs, the people of today all turn their backs upon what is right. So, of course, from the title of this Gosho, Risho Ankoku Ram, we know that what they, were turning, what they are turning their backs on is the ultimate truth. Or, of course, in the meaning of Buddhism, they are turning their backs on the law, or the Gohonzon. So this question of turning one's back, in the terms Nichiren Daishonin has written here, is not said in any way uh, as a derogatory remark about the people of that day. In many other places, in this Gosho and in other Gosho, he points out that the people are deceived by inferior teachings. This doesn't even mean to say that the people who are teaching the inferior teachings are doing it deliberately or purposely. It's a matter of ignorance. The world is in innate darkness. Our lives, he said in another Gosho, are in innate darkness. A state of ignorance as to the truth about life. In the Buddhist explanation of the three calamities and seven disasters, these natural disasters which will occur when people are not in rhythm with the universe and leading a buoyant and happy life, the first of those causes of the three calamities and seven disasters is turning one's back on or slandering, however ignorantly, the law, the true law of the universe. And the second cause of the three calamities and seven disasters is that the people are out of rhythm because they turn their backs on the truth however ignorant it may be, they will be out of rhythm, which is 
the second cause of the three calamities and seven disasters. These disasters occur because life is not in rhythm with universal life. Therefore it causes chaos and confusion not only in the people's hearts and in a country but also in all the elements. This is of course according to the principle of Eshofuni, the inseparability of man and, in, and his environment. The environment reflects the state of the people of the people's lives. If the state of the people's lives is negative, the environment will react negatively. If the state of the people's lives is positive, then the environment will react positively. And the third cause of the three calamities and seven disasters is that because of that negative state, what are known in the old Buddhist terms as demons and devils, will then take the place of the benevolent gods. That is to say, because the people are out of rhythm, then the environment will react in a way which seems to the people devilish because it is not in harmony with their lives. So in a sense, all the great teachings of Buddhism are in this one answer. So now I want to go back to the beginning of this answer, having just discussed generally the answer as a whole, to deal with it in detail. And I'll ask John to read the other important sentence which is earlier on in the answer. When a man leaves family life and enters the Buddhist way, it is because he hopes, through the teachings of the Dharma, to attain Buddhahood. Thank you. So, uh, first point perhaps I should make clear is that leaving family life uh, applies to the old uh, Buddhism of Shakyamuni's days. Shakyamuni himself, you remember, left his family and the palace and the luxurious circumstances of his life and set out to wander in the forests in order to find the truth. This was the ancient way of those who sought the truth of life. We don't do that anymore, and anyway, it would be very difficult nowadays to find a place where you could escape to. So, uh, this in modern terms means leaving family life, means that you look beyond your garden fence. You look beyond the walls of your own house. You look beyond what your neighbors say, what the people in your office say, and you try hard to open your eyes, don't you, to something greater, to life in a broader perspective, and discover the true purpose that lies at the depths of life, something that is beyond daily work and the family. And at the end of the sentence, Nichiren Daishonin says, he hopes through the teachings of the Dharma, that is to say, the ultimate true teachings of Buddhism, to attain Buddhahood. So that was a startling declaration at that time in Japan. It's difficult for us to understand now that someone saying he hopes through the teachings of the Dharma to attain Buddhahood uh, should cause a stir. But Buddhism by then had been incredibly distorted. Buddhism was, or Buddhahood, was as it were a preserve for the priests and the elite. The idea of any person being able to attain Buddhahood had totally been lost. Although Shakyamuni had referred to it many 2,000 or more years before in the Lotus Sutra. So here was Nichiren Daishonin saying again that everyone can attain Buddhahood. In other words, all the people are equal to the priests. All the people are equal to the elite of Japan at that time. They all have the potential to attain Buddhahood. So in a medieval society, that was a shattering statement 
And of course, it was that sort of remark which brought such persecutions on him. In other Gosho Nichiren Daishonin really castigated priests, he said, who wore the robes yet didn't practice the teachings. Faith is not, he said, having a shaven head. Faith is devoting yourself to the practice and struggling to do your human revolution, in other words. These were dy dynamite at that particular time. And it's no wonder that he suffered so much after it. And of course he expected it. So even today, let me emphasize, this sort of teaching when understood is a shock to certain societies in this world. Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism cannot be practiced freely and openly in certain countries of the world. Those who understand even a little of it realize that the aim of this practice is for ordinary people like you and I to attain Buddhahood. Buddhahood means wisdom, a life force. Inevitably that would threaten, for example, a fascist-oriented government. So even to this day, such teachings can cause alarm and can shake the foundations of a government or authority in certain parts of the world. We were saying last night, in certain parts of the world, still the Gohonzon has to be kept bricked in behind a wall. And the people in that country, even from the time they grew up, have never seen it and can only rely on the description that their parents give them of it. This is the world we live in. So, of course, we practice Buddhahood to attain, we practice Buddhism to attain Buddhahood. Nothing else, nothing less. Just as everyone has practiced Buddhism for this purpose in the past. And that requires, in one way or another, on everyone's part, courage, conviction, and commitment, doesn't it? The three C's. You have to have the three C's to attain Buddhahood. Courage, conviction, and commitment. In other words, you put the Gohonzon first in everything in your life. So what is Buddhahood? And I'm not sure that I can answer that very well myself. But why is it that we should struggle for enlightenment? We certainly know that enlightenment means in some sort of way that one finds true happiness. And of course, that is the ultimate meaning of it, indestructible happiness. But Buddhahood, I believe, is to understand the workings of life so well and so intensely that there are no dark areas anymore. And when there are no dark areas, there is no fear. Fear is one of the things that people suffer from so dreadfully, isn't it? Probably many of us in this room have fears, but we only have fears because of dark areas that we can't see into and don't understand. The Buddha who understands everything, therefore, has no fear. And because he has no fear, he knows his purpose, and he knows that he can fulfill it that he can turn impossible into possible because he is not bounded by fear. So because of this too, his life is free. Fear breeds doubt, fear breeds guilt. Without fear, therefore, you are free of doubt and guilt. Life has no boundaries. So it's this freedom and the achievement as a result of it, that brings indestructible happiness which nobody can possibly take away from you. So there are many, of course, concepts of happiness. All philosophies, ever since people were able to speak and write, have been concerned with human happiness. 
that Socrates and Plato were cons felt that happiness could be obtained by having uh, uh, social order and true democracy. And capitalism and socialism, perhaps you could say that they believe that happiness will come from making the majority happy. If the majority are happy and prosperous, they'll make those who are not happy and prosperous happy and prosperous. And communism uh, thinks that happiness will come from uh, a society in which all material needs are centrally supplied and controlled by the state. And through this uh, satisfaction of material needs, there is a freedom from the restrictions of competition and class. Buddhism, on the other hand, is totally different, isn't it? What Buddhism is teaching is nothing to do with relative happiness. Happiness compared with this or happiness compared with that. Buddhism goes to the depths and seeks happiness in the very depths of one's life. On the theory that if you are happy in the depths of your life, you'll be happy in every other possible aspect of your life. So Buddhist happiness, if you like to call it that, doesn't rely on anything external. It doesn't matter what may be happening around you, you can overcome it. So Buddhist happiness is not influenced by external conditions or by time or space. You could say it's a sort of universal happiness. And that is very true because it comes from realizing that each individual person is in fact a universe in itself. If you look at this from the point of view of the ten worlds, it's quite interesting. We all know that we can't escape from the ten worlds. We know that our lives are revolving through them all the time. So if we can't escape from them, obviously if they're an inherent part of human life, we must make the best of them. And this is what Buddhism sets out to do. So we can turn even the six lower worlds or the three evil paths, that is to say hell, hunger and animality, even those we can turn into value and happiness. So I'd like to just take a look at them with you, each one of them, just for a moment. If there was no hell, how could we ever know heaven? Without hell, we wouldn't understand what happiness is. Without hunger, desire, we'd have no driving force to establish a better world. Without animality, that instinctive world, there would be no instinctive love, for example, of a child for a mother. Without anger, there could be no passion for peace. Without tranquility, how could you know the joy of action? Without rapture, our desires would have no driving force. Without the effect of learning, there could be no progress. Without absorption or partial enlightenment, there could be no culture. Without the world of bodhisattva, there could be no expression of the Buddha's state in daily life through the joy of helping others. So through embracing Buddhism and practicing it, we can turn every one of those ten worlds, even hell, hunger, animality, and anger, that can be so dismal and so incredibly destructive, into value and happiness.
In other words, Buddhism is saying, don't deny the ten worlds. Don't deny that you have the six worlds and you have the three evil paths because even they are a vital part of life. So this is a very different teaching to what many other religions have taught. Now, I'd like to just talk for a moment about benefit. In Buddhism, our whole practice is based on benefit. However much we might like to hide from the fact, some of us, this is what the Buddhist practice is based on. We can turn poison, even, into good medicine. This is benefit. We can turn misfortune into fortune. And we can change punishment or retribution into something good for us. So some people really object to this. Many people will say, this sounds a very selfish religion. What a selfish practice. There are people in the world who think that to practice self-denial is the only way to be good and righteous and saintly. And of course, this has arisen from the history of Christian martyrdom, which is deeply entrenched uh, in the life of this country and of all the West. But the truth is, this is what Buddhism is saying, that it is natural to seek benefit. This is a natural human tendency. Therefore, if a teaching denies benefit in this life, it is distorting human life. And a human life that is distorted, not only can't be happy, but it can also be downright dangerous. Because people are brought up, however in a way remotely, through the traditions and customs that we grow up in, to believe that there is something nasty about benefit, then this world will continue to be ridden with guilt and with recrimination. And furthermore, I'd go far as to say that the hospitals will not cease to be full of mentally ill people until this has changed. Because it is through this teaching of self-denial, or if you like, decrying benefit, that deep in their lives, however they may have been brought up, people feel that they shouldn't be doing things for their own benefit. As a result of this, I think in the West, lives are overstrained and repressed. So to deny benefit is a most dangerous philosophy to follow. Of course, the reason why so many philosophies and religions have practiced self-denial and denied benefit in this daily life is because they didn't understand how to control desire. There's a funny noise on the microphone. All right, Tommy. They didn't understand how to control desire. Desire is so strong, we all know that it can lead us into awful troubles and unhappiness. It was the lack of finding a way to control desire adequately 
that caused religions to say the only thing to do is to suppress it. But Buddhism says desires are part of life. You can't suppress them. If you try to, they'll come bouncing out like a burst spring. And you must not suppress it, because if you do, you're tampering with life and distorting it. 